Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out. And in the video today, we're looking at the tale of the man who nearly drowned while falling from the sky. Cumulo nimbus clouds, which often have something of a mushroom or anvil shape, tend to form in regions where there are extreme updrafts of air, which can form a dense vertical tower of cloud. It's not uncommon for cumulo nimbus clouds to feature thunderstorms, hail, and other severe weather patterns. They can range from a few hundred feet at the base to 75,000 feet, that's 22,860 meters at the top. However, most of the time they aren't nearly that tall, with their peaks typically capping out at about 20,000 feet, that's about 6,000 meters. So what does all of this fun information on clouds have to do with a man drowning in the sky? Well, it's just such a cloud that Lieutenant Colonel William Rankin found himself in as he was forced to eject from his FH Crusader at about 47,000 feet, that's 14,325 meters, and at a speed of Mach 0.82 or 624 miles per hour or just over 1,000 kilometers an hour. He had to eject because his engine just died and a fire warning light came on. He was unable to get the engine restarted, lost all power, and had difficulty keeping his jet from going into a complete nosedive. With that information in mind, he decided to eject from the vehicle, despite the extreme altitude and his lack of a pressure suit. He did fortunately have an oxygen mask, which had a limited oxygen supply. With freezing weather, it was minus 50 degrees Celsius or minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit, where he initially ejected. Within seconds, he hit the top of the tower. This was at over 40,000 feet or 12,192 meters. It was at this point that he was met with severe winds, lightning, hail, rain, and a dense black cloud all around him. This is not to mention that the sudden decompression was causing swelling in his abdomen and bleeding from his eyes, nose, ears, and mouth, among many other problems. After falling for five minutes with only a few feet of visibility within the cloud, he began to think that his parachute's auto deployment system must have malfunctioned, as it was supposed to deploy at 10,000 feet, that's about 3,000 meters, and he normally should have hit that level by then. Eventually, it did kick in and his parachute deployed, though whether he was actually at 10,000 feet or not isn't actually clear, as the barometric switch that deploys the parachute automatically may have been fooled by the violent weather conditions in the storm. Whatever the case, after this parachute deployed, he was sucked back up the cloud column via the strong updraft. The cloud suck was so violent that every time it reached the apex of an upswell, his body would continue up even as the parachute stopped, so it hit the fabric in the parachute, only then to fall for a time and have the cycle repeated. From being violently tossed about, Rankin said, at one point I got seasick and heaved. During these up and down cycles, lightning was striking around him and a hail was battering him from every direction. As Rankin would later state, Boy, do I remember that lightning. I never exactly heard the thunder. I felt it. One lightning strike, not far above his parachute, lit it up, and he thought the lightning had actually struck the chute itself. His limbs also became frostbitten, and the water vapor was so thick at times he choked on it as he tried to breathe. Indeed, when this was most severe, he even thought that he might drown. During these times, he attempted to hold his breath, which seems pretty smart, but is actually incredibly unsafe when ascending or descending rapidly. When he finally broke through the bottom of the cloud a few hundred feet above the ground, he had been in the cumulonimbus tower for about 40 minutes. But this was not the end of his fun. He initially was descending towards a clearing when a gust of wind came up at the last minute and threw him into a patch of trees. Apparently a last little present from the storm. His parachute became tangled in the branches and he smacked his head right into the trunk of one of the trees. Thankfully, though, he was wearing a helmet. Once he had freed himself from the tree, he hiked along until he found a road and attempted to hitch a ride. This turned out easier said than done as his vomit-covered, bloody, ripped-up, rain-soaked flight suit hardly endeared drivers to pick him up. Eventually, someone did stop and took him to a payphone where he was able to call for an ambulance, spending the next few weeks in a hospital recovering from frostbite, decompression effects, and numerous welts and bruises all over his body. Other than these injuries, he actually suffered no long-term damage from the whole ordeal. Indeed, at that point in time, he was the only known person to parachute through a cumulonimbus tower and survive. And that was some bonus facts. In 2017, and I apologize for the pronunciation on this one, but Iwa Wisniewska Klesowicz, a Polish paraglider who was practicing for a paragliding contest in Australia, found herself accidentally sucked up into a cumulonimbus cloud. She reached a maximum altitude of just shy of 33,000 feet, that's about 10,000 meters, before reaching the top, rising at a rate of about 4,000 feet per minute, that's about 46 miles per hour or 74 kilometers an hour. Needless to say, she lost consciousness during the ordeal from lack of oxygen. 
Surprisingly, though, she actually lived through the experience, despite being unconscious for somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes while the cloud tossed her around. When she woke up, she had a nice layer of ice on her clothes, but actually managed to land safely. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't the only paraglider practicing that day who was sucked up into the cloud. He Zhongping of China also couldn't escape the cloud. When he was sucked up into it, he seems to have been struck by lightning. Whatever the case, he did not survive the ordeal. His body was found the next day about 10 miles or 16 kilometers from where he entered the cloud. And now for another bonus fact. The first ever helium inflated airship, the USS Shenandoah, was destroyed after getting caught up in an extreme updraft, resulting in it ascending rapidly from 2,100 feet to 6,200 feet, 640 meters to 1,889 meters, and then subsequently being able to descend, but then getting caught up in an even more severe updraft, bursting some of its helium bags and breaking the keel. The ship was torn apart and crashed to the ground in pieces. Amazingly, 29 of the 43 crew managed to survive of the subsequent crash by taking refuge in three different pieces of the ship that still had at least some loft as they descended. Unluckily for them, most who survived this crash died later on the Akron airship, which broke up and sunk in the Atlantic, killing 73 of the crew. Only three survived. Unfortunately, the J-3 blimp sent to search for survivors of the Akron crash also crashed into the ocean, though in this case only two people died. In any event, the USS Shenandoah would not have been destroyed at all had Commander Lansdowne's superiors listened to him. The flight it was destroyed in was made under protest, as Commander Lansdowne knew that late summer weather in Ohio often had weather conditions unsuitable for flying an airship through. However, because of the expense of the airship, military brass felt that they couldn't afford delays or a cancellation of the flights, as the airship had been extremely expensive and they needed to show it off to help sway taxpayers to view the ship more favorably. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Do not forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every other week. Also, let me thank our patrons on Patreon. If you're interested in supporting us with a small financial contribution, please do consider heading over to patreon.com forward slash today I found out. You will find a link to that in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.